The Wellness Show, episode 210. Welcome to The Wellness Show, a podcast on health and wealth. I'm your host, Tyson Bannigan, the founder of the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy. Join me as we get the latest insight, tips, and strategies from wellness providers, coaches, and successful heart-centered entrepreneurs, and much, much more. Welcome to The Wellness Show, and today we're talking with Michael Davis, and the topic for today is creating deeper connections with your story. So um, Michael has been involved with public speaking, and uh, he's also helped people get ready for uh, presentations, speaking from the stage, and also I'm trying to remember the, the other thing that you help people do as well. Oh, yes, it's the TED Talks. Ab- absolutely. You help people get ready for TED Talks as well, which is no easy feat. I do. Yeah, which is pretty exciting. So welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for showing up. And, um, and we're going to talk about this, how to get you ready to deliver your really important message to the world. And, of course, that's what Michael is going to help you do. So... How did you get involved in this area of expertise? I think I shared, I may have shared the story with you when we talked last week, Tyson. It was back in 1994. I was sitting in my boss's office. I was a fairly new financial planner at the time. And he called me in and in his, oh, his unique way, he said, we've got to talk about these evaluations from your last workshop. And I thought, this should be pretty good. And he said, this isn't good. I said, Joe, what do you mean? And he started reading through this list. You know, this guy says you're all over the map. And this guy said, what's your point? And this woman said, does this guy ever stop? (laughs) It was just one after another. And finally, I just threw up my hands. I said, Joe, is there anything good in there? He looked through a few more and he said, "Uh, yeah, here's one. Mike has nice hair. (laughs) And I said, well probably not what we're looking for is it and he said four words and I don't want to sound melodramatic but he did say four words at that point that changed the course of my life he said fix this or else so it was out of sheer desperation that I found Toastmasters International and if your viewers are familiar with Toastmasters that is where you can learn to manage your nerves and fear of speaking and and learn how to become a better public speaker And that's where I found my true passion and calling in life that your public speaking is a very powerful tool. I think it's your most important marketing and networking tool because it shows you have control. It shows, you know, your topic and it can just, it can put you in a good light or it can put you in a bad light. And as the years went by and I got more comfortable with speaking, I also became more comfortable with teaching others how to do it others who were in the same boat I was years earlier and it just my passion grew from that and like I said became a calling and I don't know if you're familiar with Carmine Gallo Uh, he's written several great books about speaking and storytelling and he 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 asked the question you know uh, what is it that um, how does he put it what sets your heart afire or heart ablaze, something like that. And it's like, what, what is it that drives you? And that, to me, that's what it is. Helping other people find their voice, express themselves and and give their messages to the world. Yeah, that's really important. I mean, you know, as a coach, I'm helping people deliver their passion to the world and discover, you know, what are the divine gifts and help them get out their own way, so to speak. But the next stage, you know, the next stage obviously is how do you get out there and spread your message? And one of the clearest, easiest ways, well, maybe not the easiest for most people, because they say one of the greatest fears that most people have, uh, other than heights, is public speaking. So, I mean, there's a lot of resistance for a lot of people getting on a stage. But that being so, I mean, that's really how you take your career to the next level, is by being comfortable about public speaking. So how do you help people get over those internal butterflies, those freaky moments where the sweat is uh, dripping off their hands before they go on that stage? Well, the first thing I do is help them understand that it is perfectly natural to feel nerves or feel nervous or afraid, actually, of public speaking. And I believe that it, it, there, I picked up that idea from a book called Confessions of a Public Speaker several years ago. And in it, the author, Scott Birkin, talks about the fact that our earliest ancestors 
if in order to survive, they had to stay in packs. If they were separated from the pack, they were in trouble. They were alone, out in the open, without a weapon, and all these eyes of predators leering at them. Well, what's public speaking? You're alone, out in the open, without a weapon, and all these eyes looking at you. Mm. So I tell people, it's a natural initial response. However, the people sitting in front of you are not saber-toothed tigers or lions trying to eat you. <laughs> People are far too busy today to get into their cars and drive somewhere to see you bomb. They do not want to see you fail. That's what YouTube is for. There's plenty of failure on YouTube and, you know, comedy, comedy central. Right. So first, that's the first thing I help. And second, there are some exercises you can do uh, physically uh, burn off some energy five or 10 minutes before you speak. Uh, the most important thing you can do though, is to be prepared. Nobody gets good by just winging it. You have to prepare, write your presentation out, uh, go through it as many times as you have to. And I'm not talking about memorization. Memorization is a mistake because if you yes. make one error with a memorized talk, it, you're going to blow it because you're going to completely lose where your, your, your place was, but just know the outline, know it so well that you don't have to think about it and your passion starts to come through. Yeah. Very interesting. Preparation is important. You reminded me of Tony Robbins, you know, when he, he goes on the stage, he's got one of those bouncers, right? And he's literally bouncing up and down before he runs up the five steps onto the stage. Like he, he's got to manage that energy. He's got to get that energy up. And he's also got to dissipate some energy to get into the zone and then up the, the stairs he goes. And then he's on, you know, full blown on the stage, ready to go. So that initial preparation, that, you know, getting that rocket fuel into your body to get you ready is important. So I apologize, I interrupted you, but I just had this picture of Tony Robbins bouncing. No, it's okay, out. it's all right. <laughs> Pretty neat. So even I love, I've seen Tony do I'm not, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah, you do. It, it's get yourself in state, as he would say, as you mentioned, uh, but, that, but you can, you're going to get the most out of the presentation when you don't have to think about it. You know it so well because every talk is going to get interrupted. Things are going to happen. Questions will come up. That's why it's important to know it. So you can do some physical activity like Tony does. I also know he does mantras. Uh, one of my coaches always says a quick prayer, if you want to call it that. He says, please help me uh, remember my speech, focus on my audience, and forget myself. Uh, I love that. So it helps you get focused on the audience. Yeah, and also it's another one of my friends for the divine to come through, isn't it? I mean, when you let get out of the way and then the words just could flow through you, that is really, really powerful. Then you're almost like speaking in tongues. Well, it is. It's being in that concept they call flow, where it's yeah. it's really I've had those moments where it comes through me, not from me. Yes. Like, I don't know where that came from, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you know you're connected with an audience. Cause I know the theme of this talk was to, how to be connected with story. And that's the first thing you do is focus on them. Uh, one of my other friends, who's also a coach of my, uh, one of my coaches, he taught me to ask four questions before I go on stage. The uh, first is, am I, uh, what, why am I here? And if, if it's to uh, get a million views on a TED Talk video or to win a contest or to get a big paycheck, your focus is in the wrong place. Right. Uh, I'm here to help the audience to get something to improve their lives some way. Uh, secondly is, am I present? Am I mentally in this room with these people or am I thinking about whatever, a bill I got that I had to fight or uh, argument with my spouse, whatever check yourself and see if you're there. Third, will I have fun? I know that some people find it hard to believe that you can have fun when you speak, but you can. And the fourth, I think is the most profound question is if this is the last talk I ever gave, what kind of impact would I want to leave? Wow. I like that one. That is really powerful. Yeah. Good. It's sort of like if this Actually, is the last my, my moment friend, I have to live on earth, what do I want to do? Yeah. So all of your passion, is in that moment, right? It is. There is a last talk we're all going to give. That most of us just don't know when that's going to be. That's right. So treat it as if yeah. it's your last one and leave a message and leave your heart there on the stage. with. And it doesn't matter if it's a group of three people in front of you or 3,003. Leave it out there with them.
Well, I know when we talked uh, about um, this interview, the pre-show discussion, the, I was saying I find it really sort of strange. I'm helping people get out of their personal story. Stop, you know, stop telling me your personal story, all oh, the poor beats and whatever. And in actual fact, you know, when you get to the stage that you're talking about, where you're, you're actually delivering your passion to the war, world, it's actually your story that has the power in it, your personal story. So the first stage is get over your story yeah. so that the story isn't devouring you alive because it's eating you up emotionally. But then once you get through that breakthrough, then you come over to you or somebody like you to deliver that story, that passion of who you are to reach your audience because it's that personal story that people can resonate with and want to work with you or buy your product or hug you or whatever your goal is that you want to do with your talk. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when we talked last week, I 100% agree with you. And I tell people, quit telling your story just to tell your story. It's a very popular topic in the business world now. Mm. And I find a lot of people sharing narratives that are boring. They're too detailed. They go on too long and they don't support a point. What I said earlier is people are too busy today. Not only do they not want to see you fail, they don't want to hear your boring story. They want to get something out of it that will make their lives better. Uh, you know, the opening story I told you about sitting in my boss's office. There's a lot of negative feeling in that story when I'm sitting there, but you don't want to hear that. I need to yeah. get to the point. Yeah. I wasn't doing well. My boss threatened my job. I had to find a solution, and I did quite accidentally change my career, my life path. That's what you need to know. You know. There are little pieces of that story that are in there, as short as it is, that are built to, uh, designed to create a physical response in your body to connect you to me. Absolutely. The so, three, yeah. well, go ahead. You're going to say the three? Well, I was going to say there are three in particular. It's dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. Those are like boosts to your body. Those are the natural chemical reactions instead of looking for other boosts like sugar, alcohol, whatever. Uh, dopamine triggers curiosity. So in that story, did you have any curiosity about it? Yeah, I wanted to know what the hell was going to happen. There you go. That's number one. Number two, endorphins. Did you feel a connection to me in any way, any kind of bonding? Yeah, I could feel that, oh, my God, I, what would I do in that situation? Yeah, you got in three, you, you laughed when he said, yeah, you know, I, I, I can still see hilarious. the sheet. Mike has nice hair. Yeah. <laughs> Good, and I was relieved that it was you, not me, right? <laughs> it's it. And that those three chemicals, or I call them chemicals, but natural chemicals in the body are triggered in a short story like that. Most people haven't learned how to do that. All I'm trying to do with that story is not sell you a product or service. I'm just trying to open your heart up to say, okay, this guy may have something of value. That is more critical today than ever because of the marketing messages we're bombarded with. It just gets to be too much. And that's how we start to separate ourselves from the crowd. Yeah. So tell me about this whole thing about TED Talks. Everybody you know, sort of has that as some sort of benchmark, you know, we have to have a TED talk or you need to have a TED talk or you had a superstar level. If you have a TED talk or how many TED talks can we get or, or what's the, the response rate you're getting if you apply for, you know, 10 TED talks and you get five or you're doing really well. I mean, it goes on and on. And there's so much around TED talk, TED talk, TED talk. And, and it's, I'm curious, you know, what is so um, empowering about TED talks? Well, I think, and I'm a big fan of TED Talks. I wouldn't be a TEDx coach for my local TEDx if I wasn't. However, I do caution anybody that talks to me. So let, let's take a look at why it's a phenomenon. Number one, I believe it is um, the best TED Talks connect on a, very, on a personal level. Because if you go watch, and there's a list, and I can make it available, or just type in Google top 10 or top 25 TED Talks, the, the individual's who've connected are just talking with us like you and I are right now. Mm -hmm. They're not speakers who are putting on a show or they're not, not trying to motivate you or sell you a product or service. They literally are sharing an idea that is a different perspective on the way we think. 
in the other aspect, and this is what the TED curators have discovered, 18 minutes is the maximum talk, and that's not an accident. They've done the research, and that's about as long as people want to sit and listen to a talk. If they want more information, they'll go get it. And if it's a bad talk, well, 18 minutes, it's, it's not like you've given up two or three hours of your time and blown a whole night. It's just a bad talk. But I think the key, it, it really is no more complicated than these are extraordinary ideas and different perspectives on topics. Nobody's inventing new topics. Right, right. For example, the number one talk from Sir Ken Robinson at this, as of this point is at 51 million views. He talks about how schools are creating, uh, killing creativity. Uh, schools is not a new topic. Creativity is not, but his perspective and his research is showing that most schools are, are really killing, you know, just knocking it out of kids by the time they graduate. Yeah, I can attest to that. But the way he does it is, yeah. Yeah, and the way he, he does, does it, it in a humorous right. fashion, and it makes, yeah, it is. And it's a 12 year old talk. Yeah. So, so, so how, that's the know, first, that's the first thing Tyson is. So this interesting, I mean, here we are, we're in an interview and usually they last, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Yeah, but if the magic number is 18 and I've heard the magic number is for 20 for a video, then it seems as though somehow we're missing our calling by having a 30 minute, 45 minute discussion. It's sort of interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, how do you make all this work, right? Where you're reaching the right people for the right length of time and, and getting your, uh, you know, your material and your ideas across where you're empowering people to make their next step. It's sort of interesting. But I agree with you. The TED Talk is really empowering. It's mm -hmm. uplifting. It has a, a brilliance to it that is, um, it gives you that aha or that new perspective of seeing the world and through, like almost through new eyes, the eyes of the speaker. So how does that get monetized? I mean, because you're, you're not allowed to be, you know, selling from the stage uh, when you do a TED Talk. That's not the idea. It's original, brilliant ideas or different concepts that are being expressed. So is it just because people are watching your TED Talk that it gives you cachet or credibility and then they want to know who you are and, or they want to maybe hire you as a guest speaker? How does that monetization happen? Well, I've seen different results. It's number one, the most common is you are asked to come in and speak. Usually those are paid speaking engagements. Uh, some people have written books based on that one idea. Maybe they've had a lifetime of research and they condensed it into an 18 minute talk. Then they were approached by somebody who said, Hey, this needs to be a book. I've heard of that. Uh, they create other products, maybe video series or coaching. So that's how you monetize it. But I want to get back to this idea that you ask, you know, there's so many reasons people want to do a TED talk. Right. The worst reason to do a TED talk is to say, I want to go viral. Mm. Well, the audience is going to see through that just like they would in a regular speech if right. you're up there selling. Because in essence, you're selling something. Yeah. You're selling an idea of, I'm going to go viral. I had a woman ask me that today on a phone call who was considering hiring me to coach her. And I said, do not hire me based on we're going to go viral. I said, I can't guarantee that. I can't even guarantee you're going to be accepted at a right. TED Talk. We're going to do everything we can to position you with your unique idea. And I thought she, has, she does have a good idea, and I think it will get her on a TED stage. But I said, this whole idea, I want to go viral. The audience is not your central focus in that. And, and people are very sophisticated today. They know a, a, a snake oil salesman when they see it. So have an idea that you know can shape and change others' lives because it changed yours. It will go viral if some things are in place. Number one, it's a great message. Uh, unfortunately, this is, it's a fact of life like marketing. You have to have a good title. Mm -hmm. There's just no two ways about it. I've seen some great talks that have only gotten a thousand hits because the title was so boring and pedestrian that people just went right by it because the topic was so, you know, there's a thousand people talking about it. Right. You have to put a lot of thought in, in study. How do you create a title just like you would a, a newspaper headline? Or, or a book title. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a hard fact to accept, but if you can't get that right, all the hard work in the world is not going to overcome a bad title. Right. 
So uh, in, interesting enough, what's the connection between learning to do a TED Talk, which is a different skill set? I mean, it's really a how to take ideas and condense them, you know, you know, whether you use overheads, don't over use head, overheads. There's so much research that goes in in preparing something to do a TED Talk. What's the translation over to, um, you know, an ordinary speak to sell talk or a speaking engagement type talk? Are they two different animals and you prepare for them differently? Or are the things that, that one would learn from a TED Talk and the way that you have to couch everything around ideas in 18 minutes that are transferable to other speaking from the stage uh, situations? I think from a material standpoint, they're similar. You have to have compelling ideas with stories that are entertaining and uh, insightful that help sell the point. Or I find the biggest difference is, Tyson, is in the delivery. Now think about, you mentioned Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is all over the stage. Now, he's the extreme. He can get away with it. But the speakers who are constantly moving all over the stage, okay, I don't like it. I think it's too distracting. But they can use the whole stage area for their speech and that people expect that, so do it. With Ted, you've got a six-foot round uh, red dot that you cannot leave in most cases. Wow. And you are confined to standing in one spot. And when I first got involved with TEDx, I didn't like it. I wasn't comfortable. But now I love the concept because it forces you to be more, conver excuse me, more conversational. Right. Speakers go into speaker mode often. You can tell somebody who's becoming a speaker. They don't talk the same way they do off stage. The best TED Talks, you can take the, turn the camera off, take the audience out, and they will keep that same conversational style. Wow. And that's what I, I watch Sir Ken Robinson. I mentioned him earlier. He, I don't think he moves two feet either way in his talk. And it's like, man, he is talking to me. Wow. Well, then, that's I don't the biggest Tony difference I see. I mean, Tony Robbins isn't even on the stage. He's in the audience. I mean, he's almost in the bleachers. I mean, that guy moves, right? So putting Tony yes. Robbins on the Spot, on the spot, so to speak, that would, I mean, he, I think he would squirm to death. Well, maybe he wouldn't, but it's well, interesting. He, well, here's the thing. He does have a talk, Tyson. If you watch it, he has a TED talk. First yeah. of all, he went over 18 minutes and he told him he probably would. He doesn't stand still. And the curator, Chris Anderson, just said, okay, just do it. Because <laughs> it's Tony Robbins. He's going to get away with it. Yeah. Uh, but for most people, you know, Bill Gates yeah. gave a very compelling, he's given more than one talk. It, yeah, it, you have to change up your style. And yeah. it, I have to take, when I coach speakers, I got some work to do. I've got to turn the speaker off for them and just say, look, you've got to stand here and talk to me like we're talking over dinner. Yeah, and, and it's not what really what a good interview is. Like it's you and I sitting in, uh, you know, in the Chesterfields or in a living room, you know, or you in your chair and I in the Chesterfield having an ordinary conversation. And if it's not an ordinary conversation, it doesn't really fly. It feels uh, really stilted. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which, which is a real technique. That, that, that's the beauty of the tech. Yeah. Well, it is, and it takes practice, and I'm yeah. still, I, uh, this is my fourth year of coaching TEDx, and I think I finally got it this year. Uh, the most important aspect of my coaching others is to turn it down, just be you. I mean, right. you should be anyway when you're speaking. But people expect you to be a little bit of a speaker up there. Yeah, well, I just got some feedback. I mean, I think I'm on my 208th interview, um, you know, this type of interview, and I got a comment saying, you know, I'm really enjoying your show and you're starting to feel, it starts to feel like you're more comfortable uh, in your show. And I think, well, yeah, only 208 shows to get, you know, to get the feeling across that I'm comfortable in the show while well, at least I'm getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it takes, it does take a certain amount of letting go that, you know, it is just a normal process and it's going to be full of goofiness at times and that's okay. Or technology not working like it wasn't for us this morning. It's just the way it is. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've been, uh, there's a group that I do a lot of work with and I host a weekly webinar for them on Zoom. And I'll tell you the first six months, I was constantly stressed because I, I was doing it for someone else. It was his baby, not mine. And I, yeah. I was more stressed than I ever am for my own. And you're right, it's that repetition. I think about Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. 
Yes. Yeah. Now, in preparation and everything else you've done, you're pushing 10,000 hours, I'm sure, with all the work you do with these podcasts and the time and the, it, the years it took you to get that skill to be good enough just to start interviewing on a podcast or a webinar. Uh, so, you know, same for me. First 10 years of speaking, I was so anxious and so nervous. I was not myself. And it took probably close to 10,000 hours eventually to get to the point where when I'm on stage, I'm going to be myself. And as you and I talked about on the phone last week, you got to be yourself. Right. Some people don't like you. So be it the way it is. Yeah. That's really the clue in in all what we're doing is showing up and being authentic, you know, warts and all people will love you for being you, not you trying to be somebody else. Right. This is not, you're not trying to be an actor. You don't have a role that you're playing on the stage. You're just being you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's, and it, that's why storytelling is so challenging in, in front of a group because you want, you, you're you going to tell an authentic story. You've got to learn what, what needs to be in and what, what's the, what needs to come out. There are seven steps or keys to storytelling that I've learned uh, that, and, and I know you want, we want to talk about connecting in story. So, the seven steps are you have to show a character in a relatable situation, uh, which is not positive. It's putting them in some kind of distress or danger or pain, whatever, uh, relatable circumstances. And then there has to be conflict in that person's life. This circumstance has to be creating some kind of negativity or some bad potential outcome that they need to overcome. They have to stretch outside of their comfort zone. They've got to try or do something new. And at some point in the story, a guru, a sage, a wise person has to come in and teach our central character a new way of thinking, feeling, or acting. Mm. And once that character learns that and they implement it, then we need to see the new way of life. What is it that, how are you living, feeling better, thinking better, doing things differently? And the ultimately, what is the cure of your problem? And then there has to be a carry out message that shows, uh, that sums up the story so that people remember it long after you speak. Yes. So it sounds like the, the four stages of, of anything of, of marketing, you know, what is the gap between where you are and where you want to go, right? Or where the audience is and where you want to get the audience to. And then what's the vision? You know, what's what, why are you doing this anyway? What's the mm-hmm. vision? you're trying to present in front of them and then you know what's the bridge to get them from where they are to where you want like them to to experience right and then you know while you're there then what's the next step you know what's that call to action or how can i leave you with something that is going to be you can take into your future or make your next best step so for a coach or somebody listening to the show here um how does uh, speaking from the stage, from your perspective, fit into the, you know, a person who's coming from a coaching or a healer or, you know, or a change agent point of view of that, that's what they feel their mission and calling. Where does speaking fit into that, uh, into that sort of overall rubric of delivering their message to the world? How, how do you see that fitting? I'm biased because of what I do, but I believe it is the core marketing tool that you have because mm-hmm. you can put the best website out there, and you know this Tyson, you can put the best website, you can put the best brochure, one page, all that. But if you cannot stand in front of a group and demonstrate confidence and competence and show a unique perspective on your topic, long term, you're not going to succeed. Right. Because people today, and I've been reading a lot lately about you know, how technology, we had our technology issues earlier, how you know, technology is taking over. It's just a natural evolution of our society. But what the people who are standing out are the great communicators. Right. Technology you know, just doesn't stay. make you a great communicator. It'll help you deliver your message, but it's not going to take the place of the humanness of being a communicator. And so that's what you're teaching people. So I yeah, see in the book. Go ahead. I was going to say in the book, five stars, which Carmine Gallo just released again, I think he's a great writer about speaking and storytelling. He interviews somebody who estimates that in the next decade, 
47% of our jobs are going to be replaced by AI or technology and they're not coming back. Now that scares a lot of people, but he also points out in the last 500 years, every time there's been what they call a tectonic shift in our economies, there are more jobs that are created on the other side. And he goes through all that to tell us that the people who learn to communicate face to face or what we're doing now or in front of groups, they're the ones that are going to be the one that, that have the, the best jobs, and earn the most money and have the most impact. So being a communicator is absolutely key as technology takes over the workplace and makes, uh, takes care of the mundane, you know, go to work type things. So being a communicator, sharing ideas, inspiring people, delivering a, you know, a unique, your unique message to the world becomes the key aspect. So I'm curious, I noticed that on your Zoom it says Stage Time University. What's that? Oh, that is work. Uh, that's the group that I do work for. And sometimes oh, we have each, <laughs> I get on the wrong Zoom. But um, Stage Time is a group that was started. It's a, an online university. And I'm one of the coaches and I host their monthly webinar or weekly webinars. It's just a way to give people more information about uh, speaking and how to become better presenters and also build a, a speaking business if you want to. Oh, great. And so what's your CPR Academy? Is that what, did I get that right? Is that, is it an academy, but you got CPR? Uh, speak, no, speaking, you know, that's my company, Speaking CPR. And yeah. the whole idea behind that when I started the company 10 years ago was that I think that most, comp most uh, speeches are on life support. Yeah. And they need some life breathed into them. Absolutely. They're dead in the water. That was the start of that. And yes, a lot of them are. And it was interesting, not long after that, I was sitting down with a couple of friends and I said, you know, my name is pretty ordinary. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to make it stand out. I said, I got this cool company name. And my buddy, uh, Joe, said, um, your initials are MD. Why don't you become the public speaking MD? And I thought, well, that's pretty good. So we, I started testing it. And the ultimate test was at the time I was still a financial advisor, but I was transitioning to speaking. And I asked a group of clients of mine who were all physicians what they thought. They loved it. And I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the public speaking MD now. So you got to be creative with the ordinary at times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm working with somebody called Dr. Fitness USA. So there you are, you know, um, putting that yeah. you know, doctor in front of it. So uh, I, I love what you're talking about. It's very inspiring, and you're available to help people really get clear and comfortable about delivering their, their message to the world, which I agree with you is, you know, that is um, the most important thing that you can do as a change agent, as a wellness provider, as a coach, or you know, any of these types of professions is to be able to be comfortable in delivering your message. So how do people get hold of you? How do they work with you? Uh, they can reach me at mike at speakingcpr.com. You can also visit speakingcpr.com, my website, if you'd like more information. And there's a free resource I'll offer to all your viewers, Tyson. It's 52storytellingtips.com. That'll give you a feel for, for what I teach and, and how my, my process and my style. Just go to 52storytellingtips.com. And every week you'll get a five-minute audio, which is just one tip. And then the idea is you build one skill on top of another over a 12-month period. I believe that's the long, the, the best way to internalize and make new ideas stick. Not learn them in a, a, an eight-hour boot camp. You just you don't retain it all. This right. way, you can slowly implement these into your presentations. And uh, yeah, that folks are more than uh, welcome to to contact me or sign up for the tips. No obligation. It's my list. Nobody else gets it, so you won't get spammed. That sounds great. And if you're if you're listening to this as a podcast. Uh, or even as you know on the academy youtube channel or even on facebook all of this will be in the show notes so you don't you don't have to grab your pen and rewind to figure out all this all those links hot links will be in in the show notes so as we are winding up here i know that uh, this is really important so what would you like to leave the listeners with what's the key aspect of what we were talking about that you like to to leave everybody with 
Well, I'm going to borrow from my favorite writer who I've just, who I've mentioned a couple of times, Carmine Gallo. He asks this question and I've started asking this question of all people I work with. And, and I, I, I remember it now. I, I kind of butchered it earlier. His question is what makes your heart sing? Mm. What is it that, I mean, it's cliche, but when you get up in the morning, what is it that, that makes you think, God, oh, I can't wait to go out and do this today. And I and when you go to bed at night, how, how did I help people today and how can I help them tomorrow? When I started thinking about that question, I realized why I love speaking and coaching so much. It's because when I was a little boy, my parents and my grandparents instilled in me the importance of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Not just the way it's written in the, in the uh, Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights, but the idea that if you have something to say and you can say it, it can be a life changer, not just for you, but for everybody who hears it, who implements it. And that's what I love to do. And that's what I want to help people do. Get that message out there. So whatever it is that your passion is, this goes a step below passion, if you will, or beyond passion is what makes your heart sing. Because when you have that, then your stories will, you learn how to tell the stories the right way. They will have a massive impact on who knows how many people and through, if we, if you do a Ted talk or you write a book or you get online and go viral, that will all take care of itself. If you got the passion, you know, what makes your heart sing and you're getting the stories out there. Yeah. So find your passion and speak your truth into the world. And it will not only change you, but everybody around you. That's a powerful message. And I thank you very much for that. I also realized uh, in something similar that I'm doing that is a parallel that is, your, what's in your voice, there's more information in your voice than there is in your fingerprint. So when you learn uh, the mm -hmm. power of your voice and you speak your truth, then you're setting your soul song free. And I help people do that by doing quantum sound uh, therapy, which is using your voice to be your guide to release you from any trauma or, or any unresolved conflict that's in your way of you speaking your truth. So it's, it's associated with what you're teaching people. It's a way and help them free up their voice so that they, the truth of who they are can shine through. Their soul can start to speak. So you're talking about something that's a very much a passion for me as well. And thank you for being on the show. It was a great conversation. And I hope you have many clients who want to work with you because who wouldn't want to learn how to do this? Who wouldn't want to have a TED Talk? Absolutely. Who wouldn't want to get their message in their world? And who wouldn't want to do that with love and brilliance and change people's lives? So thank you ever so much for being on the show. It was lots of fun. Thank you, Tyson. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Bye for now. For quality online wellness products, courses, and services, visit our sponsors, thewellnessstore.ca and the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy located at thewellnessacademy.ca. To stay in touch, visit us at thewellnessshow.ca. And until next time, be healthy, wealthy, and wise.